Open your ears. For the fifth Sabladovich collection your annual commission, Bedford-based artist Andy Holden has created his most ambitious project to date. Maximum and Irony, Maximum Sincerity, 1999 to 2003, towards a unified theory of MIMS, narrates a history of the formation of the MIMS art movement, founded in Bedford by Holden, along with his childhood friends John Blamey, James McDowell, Roger Illingworth and Johnny Parry, and which culminated in the writing and signing of the MIMS manifesto. The work takes the form of a feature-length film in seven chapters, installed within a huge sculpture that is both a work about MIMS and a work of MIMS. The film opens with a shot of a paper man delivering the local Bedford paper which has the word MIMS on the front cover and has the MIMS manifesto inside. This was something we did for real, buying the front cover ad space, enabling us to put the manifesto through the door of 90,000 homes in Bedfordshire. The exhibition looks at how a town, in hindsight, shapes the concepts and ideas that are born there. And key places in Bedford are used in the film to suggest how the ideology of MIMS might be contingent upon the town's history such as the Bunyan Meeting House, where John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress, being used to stage the auditions, which were then documented as part of the film. MIMS is all about the willingness to be lied to and the will to believe. It's all about the intense sadness of our unrealistic dreams and the intense joy of our desire for them. The process of the exhibition was to kind of take the MIMS manifesto and work out what it meant to me both then and what it means to me now. Like the love songs we do in Brave Soldier, I do. And the irony? Okay. If we're looking at it in terms of mims, we've got this repeated structure, the box motif. One of the key ideas was to use, or to cast teenage actors to play myself and my friends at that age in Bedford, kind of in the process of writing the manifesto. And the idea was somehow that this combination of irony and sincerity that we advocated in the manifesto was perhaps contingent upon our age and the idea of being 18, 19 years old and this sort of um, transition point between kind of, or of adolescence. The exhibition consists of numerous works made as part of the MIMS manifesto, some made at the time and in their original form, some re-edited, some remade and some entirely reimagined. For example, the teenager Alex, who plays me in the film, recreates a key work of MIMS which consisted of spending all day in Bedford shaking hands with people. There is also a mini golf course that is a work of MIMS that we would have liked to have made at the time but were not able to. This was made as both a real social sculpture in Bedford as well as being a set for the film. All the music in the film is made from songs we wrote as part of MIMS, um, as we felt at the time that the song, and the love song in particular, might be a good form for an artwork to take. So the songs were rearranged for children's choir and orchestra, which was performed in a live concert, and then we then filmed and recorded this uh, to make the film's soundtrack. Sorry, I, sorry, I slightly stopped listening for a second. It shifts tone from starting out like a documentary and gradually becoming more and more staged using the conventions of cinema. The birds would still be on their way south and the deers would still be drinking out of that water hole. And they threw their arms around each other and cried and cried and cried. And that was when it hit him right in the face, a mango. And there's always tomorrow. The work also includes a large piece called Last Stop for the Good Old Times, After the Age of Innocence, which consists of hundreds of images of idealised childhood purchased from Bedford charity shops, which was a work I made in about 1999 as a work of MIMS, and then have sort of continued to do as a new part of the installation. And of course, they're all happy endings. The structure recombines the sets built for the film into new structures. They are based on locations that were key to the development of MIMS, such as my friend Pops' bedroom, my teenage studio, which is my mum's utility room at the back of the house, and Poppins. Do you think MIMS is naturally conservative? I mean, it's always kind of, could be seen as regressive. Well, yeah, it's certainly conservative in its imagery. But I think the point is that it's against the idea of linearity, of there being progress necessarily, that certain things will reoccur. Poppins, which was kind of ironically and sincerely adapted as our kind of headquarters for discussions around what MIMS might be and where we ended up signing this manifesto. A work of art made of quantum MIMS can be more moving than one which is simply sincere or simply ironic because it acknowledges the gap, the essential unfulfilled journey in all of us. Yet, it is ultimately hopeful. I'm very pleased we put the can be in there. Not it. Rather than definitely is. Mm. The piece looks at the idea of nostalgia as something that structures so much of how we process the world. It's about how we kind of present the past to ourselves through the act of imagination. Uh, 
memory is of the past, as it were. And how do we represent that past, except within the light of the present? Come On Home, uh, which uh, was a song that Roger wrote, um, and it was a kind of performance we did at a, a, well, a performative event that was structured around his 18th birthday, which sort of kind of loosely reconfigured that in a sort of more dreamlike final scene um, and morphed it into a play that James wrote at that time called Players which was going to be this great total work of Mims. In the last scene these things start to kind of merge together to try and make an attempt at kind of closure, an attempt at kind of making this giant, I don't know, finishing somehow this giant new work of Mims.